we change gears today and tomorrow. First, we're moving from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Second, we move from the ancient Near East to the Greco-Roman world. To us in the Western world, which includes most of us in North America and also Europe, the ancient Near East seems foreign to us. We're separated not only by time, but also by a significant cultural gap. Their customs and traditions are alien to us. Now, present-day Arabs and people that live in the Middle Eastern area, they're still separated by time, and some of the cultures and traditions have changed, but their culture has descended from that ancient Near Eastern culture, and they have preserved many of the customs and traditions. And so for them, that ancient Near Eastern world may not seem as foreign or alien to them. Now, if you remember back the very first chapel, I know it's been a long time since then, you've had lots of paperwork to turn in, you've been busy with clubs, but I used fish bowls to introduce that idea. Uh, it's like a fish bowl is around the Bible, and that's the culture and the time that it was written in, and it's like we're peering in, and it can make it hard to interpret the text, but if we learn about that culture, it can help us see through it a little bit better and to understand what that text means to us today. And also, if we come to where we are, it's like we're looking through our own fishbowl, which is our own time and our own culture looking back. And our own culture is Western culture, and it developed out of the Greco-Roman world. So when it comes to the New Testament, the setting where Jesus was born, it feels a lot more familiar to us. We're separated from time also. Some of the cultures and traditions have changed, but a lot of our culture was based on and developed out of that culture, so it feels a lot more comfortable to us. What happened between Babylon and Persia that we discussed the last couple of days and the Roman Empire that Jesus was born into? What happened in those few hundred years before, between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New, the period known as the Intertestamental Period? Well, the world was changed by one man. I know it's summer, you shouldn't have to think about stuff like this, but I know most of you probably know who that is. And don't reach for the Sunday school answer because it's not Jesus. He hasn't been born yet. We're talking about that 400 year period between the old, end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament where Jesus is born. Who's that one man who changed the world? I don't hear anyone saying anything. Was it Alexander the Great? Alexander the Great. He conquered the known world, and in addition to his military campaigns and invading countries, he was doing something else. He was spreading Greek culture and the Greek language, a process called Hellenization. Greek became the lingua franca of the entire world. Everyone spoke Greek. It's the language that the New Testament was written in. And God's providence can be seen in these events. If Jesus had been born into the fragmented world of the ancient Near East, where each city in a country might speak a different language, the story of Jesus might not have spread near as fast. But here we had a world that was not only you know, linked together as one empire with trade so they could get the writings out, but everyone spoke the same language, so once they got those writings, they could read those writings, and that message was able to spread quickly throughout the Greco-Roman world. Christianity today is growing by leaps and bounds in Africa and Asia. These Christians may more easily identify with the ancient Near Eastern world than we can, but most Americans, as well as most Europeans, feel more at home in the Greco-Roman world of the New Testament. You probably had never heard of the various gods of the ancient Near East that we've been talking about the past few chapels, but you've probably heard of many of the Greek and Roman gods or at least have a basic familiarity with them. We still have TV series like um, Hercules and Xena, uh, movies that are still coming out in theaters like Clash of the Titans and Wrath of the Titans that just came out this year that are based on the myths about the Greek gods. So our culture is a lot more familiar with them and we're more at home in that world. Our government and founding documents were even inspired by Greek philosophy and Greek thought. Washington, D.C. and most state capitals even based their architecture on Greek architecture. So we are moving from the Old to the New Testament. We're also moving cultures. We're moving from the culture of the ancient Near East to the Greco-Roman world. But also, the nature of the antagonist is markedly different here. The gods Yahweh comes into conflict with in the Old Testament are not only false gods, they're fake gods. Isaiah 37, 19, and I'm going to read just the last part of that verse. It says, They were not gods, but only wood and stone, fashioned by human hands. Just as Amy was telling you uh, before she got up here, the gods that they worshipped back then and the idols people still worship today, they aren't really gods at all. They're 
wood or metal or whatever material somebody's put together. Some have suggested that Satan or demons were behind the pagan gods in the Old Testament. This is very possible, but we have nothing in the text to back it up. Any attempt to identify satanic activity behind the idols must be considered conjecture. The apocryphal book Jubilees describes the Egyptian, Egyptian magicians being able to imitate some of the plagues as being Satan's power. Uh, apocryphal means that it didn't make it into the Bible, though. And while we can learn a lot about the world by these books that are apocryphal books, there's usually good reasons they didn't make it into the Bible, so we want to be cautious when reading them. And if we stick with the canonical possible that the magicians were able to imitate the few plagues that they could through illusion or through parlor tricks, the bigger plagues when I got to those, they stopped being able to do it. And the things they did were never very impressive, so it's very possible they had tricks and were just making it appear that they had powers. It's also clear from most of the stories that we've been looking at the past few days that God was not facing an inferior God or a less powerful being, but that he was competing with nothing at all. It's not that Dagon was weaker than God. He was just a piece of wood. He was nothing there that could stand up to God. And when Elijah faced down the prophets of Baal, it's not that God was keeping Baal from sending his fire down. It's that no matter how loud those prophets shouted, no matter how much they cut themselves, there was just nobody up there to hear them to send fire down. God was the only one there to hear, and he did hear when Elijah called to him. But today we're looking at Jesus versus Satan, and Satan is very real. And 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 calls him the God of this age, and that's the NIV, depending on what version you have, it may call him the God of this world. And it says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan isn't a god, but that title recognizes that he does have supernatural powers, and that God has allowed him some limited authority here on earth. We saw in that verse in 2 Corinthians that he has the authority to try to keep people from believing in God, and he does everything he can to prevent that. Jesus has an actual encounter with Satan in the desert. Judaism has no concept of Satan in the Old Testament. When we look at the Old Testament, there are various evil supernatural agents at work throughout the Old Testament, but they're never identified with a single persona like we see in the New Testament. The one who tempts even the Garden of Eden is only ever described as a serpent. Sometime during that intertestamental period we were talking about, that 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, the Jews began to develop a theology of Satan. And by the time the New Testament begins, when Jesus is born, there was a strong concept of Satan in Jewish theology. Some people suggest because of that, that you know, Satan is something that was made up in that intertestamental period, but we don't have to jump to that conclusion. Just because it wasn't clear in the Old Testament, Jesus wasn't clear in the Old Testament either. God reveals things to us over time, and as he reveals more and more to us, it becomes clear. And then we can look back at those stories in the Old Testament and see that these agents of supernatural evil, like the serpent in the Bible, were probably Satan at work. Prior to beginning his ministry, Jesus has a confrontation with Satan in the desert. This confrontation is recorded in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, which are the first three Gospels, and they're called synoptic because they tell a lot of the same stories. Then John's out there, and he tells a lot of the stories that aren't included in the first three. And you've got there at the top of your handout the references where you find the story of Jesus coming into conflict with Satan in the desert in each of those passages. Mark, as you will notice there, is only two verses. Mark doesn't go into a lot of detail. He basically says Jesus was tempted by the devil, and then goes on with his story. He doesn't tell us what any of the temptations were. Now, Matthew and Luke, they actually give us three of the temptations. There may have been more, as we see, you know, Mark didn't give us any. And um, Matthew and Luke, their tales are almost identical, except for the order is different. So, I'm going to only be looking at the story as told by Matthew today. But you've got the two passages there, so if in your own study you wanted to read both Matthew and Luke together, you can compare the two and see the changes and see maybe why Matthew and Luke made the decisions they did when telling that story. I'm not going to talk about it, but I did give you there in your handout how the order of the three temptations differs from Matthew to Luke.
So we'll start in Matthew, since that's the one that we're looking at, and the story is told in the first few verses of Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So the very first thing we know about this story is that Jesus has been fasting for 40 days. When Matthew says that he was hungry, he wasn't kidding. There is biblical precedent for Jesus' long fast. We see other biblical figures that have fasted for 40 days. Moses did it when he was receiving the Ten Commandments from God. In Exodus 34, 28, Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And there's another biblical figure, and it was Elijah, and here he is running for his life from Jezebel. And so he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Torah, the mountain of God. So that was the last he ate before he took a long travel of 40 days and 40 nights. So he fasted for 40 days, and at the end of that he has an encounter with God. So before they have these big encounters or starting something big, we see that there's bill figures that have fasted for 40 days. And Jesus preparing to start his ministry here where he has fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And so, Satan starts out with a low blow, knowing that Jesus hasn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. But then again, he's Satan. What did we expect? If Jesus isn't only hungry at this point. He has to be starving. He hasn't eaten in 40 days. And so we see here in verse 3 that um, Satan talks. And it says, The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God... Tell these stones to become bread. Turning stones to bread would not have been some inappropriate use of Jesus' divine powers. We see him do miracles like that throughout his whole career in ministry. One time he took two fish and five loaves and multiplied that food to feed a large crowd. But here he was obediently fasting. Satan was pitting his stomach against his commitment to his father. Since he was divine, how easy it would have been to satisfy his hunger. He didn't have to um, go somewhere to get food. He could have just snapped his fingers right there and had food, and it would have been so easy that cheating on his fast. You know, nobody's watching. You know, I can eat a little bit. But he was fasting so that he could be in a state where he was prepared to begin his ministry. That's why he was doing such a long fast. Jesus responds to Satan by quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. And I'll just read the words from... Matthew, where it records, and Jesus answered, It is written, People do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Satan likely knows Jesus' purpose on earth. He's not omniscient, but I suspect at this point, after Jesus was born, that he knew some of the events that were coming up. He knew that the cross was coming up. Satan gets into scripture quoting himself. He says that God will command his angels, and we see here in verse 6, him quoting from Psalms 91. And he says, um, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. The cross is going to result in and great pain and agony for Jesus. While on the cross, he could have called down thousands of angels to save him. The Romans weren't putting him on that cross. He was allowing them to put him on that cross. So Satan has taken him to a really high point and dares him to jump. If God could protect him from that, surely God could protect him from the pains of the cross. But Jesus proves by resisting the jump and just let God protect him, that also when he has the pain of the cross, that he's going to be able to resist calling on thousands of angels to save him at that point as well. And again we see Jesus quoting from Deuteronomy, this time from Deuteronomy 6.16, and it's in verse 7 of Matthew 4. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Satan must have a thing for high places. He's taking God to a high place here and daring him to jump off, Next, he takes him to a high mountain. 
Maybe it's because Satan knows that he's going to be condemned to the depths of hell once Jesus comes in the final judgment. And once he has Jesus at the top of this mountain, he offers him the kingdoms of the world that he can see. And in verse 8 it says, Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus was born to be a king. These kingdoms were going to be his anyway. The difference is, Satan was offering to them to him now. Jesus is going to have to die, rise again, and someday return triumphantly before he becomes king of these kingdoms. He's going to have to go through that pain and that agony of the cross. And so Satan is basically saying here, skip all that. Worship me, and you can become king of those kingdoms right now. Now, you remember from when we talked about the golden calf, this is again several days ago, the Israelites were given a choice between right now or the right time. And I said, you know, one of the reasons with, in our own lives we may choose the golden calf over God, when we choose things that we enjoy or things that are just less valuable instead of something that's as amazing as God, and one of those reasons is because we're attracted to the right now. We want what we want right now instead of waiting for when God says it's the right time. The Israelites fell that test when it was given to them. They wanted Moses down there right then. Since he wasn't, they made a golden calf. They chose the right now over the right time. But we see that Jesus makes the right decision. He doesn't sacrifice what is good in the future for what he could have right then. He orders Satan to leave him, and quotes from Deuteronomy 6.13. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. So the temptations are over, and God does care for him, so he sends angels now to take care of him and probably feed him after he has an eaten 40 days. So now we're going to move on to what we can learn about God from this showdown. And some of you, um, if you were looking ahead, may have already looked up that verse in your um, Bible and filled in those blanks. Well, the ones of you haven't, you know, we'll go ahead and look at that and fill that in together. But observant Jews recite daily something they call the Shema. And it comes from Deuteronomy 6.5. And it represents the very core of Jewish belief and theology. And... Deuteronomy 6.5 is written right there on your handout, so as I read over that, you can fill that in. And Deuteronomy 6.5 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. The three temptations Jesus faces in the desert correspond with the three parts of that saying. The Israelites' hunger during their own time in the desert was meant to test their hearts. God let them hunger to test them, to know what was in their hearts, and whether they would keep his commandments or not. And in Deuteronomy 8, 2, and 3, it says, you know, he was testing them by hunger, he was testing their hearts. And the Israelites fell, but here, Jesus didn't let his hunger sway his heart from his commitment to his Father. And ask yourself, is God first in your heart, or are your own needs? What comes first in your heart? What are the things that you're most concerned about? Are you most concerned about what God wants for your life? Are you more concerned about what you want for your life, what you want to do? And we need to be concerned first and make sure that God is placed first in our heart. Then Satan tempted Jesus to save his own life, or to save his own soul. And you know, our soul is our life force. And you know, jump off this mountain and allow God to catch you. And he was trying to save him, you know, save your soul from the punishment of and the agony of the cross, where he was going to take upon him the sin of everyone else so that we could be saved. But Jesus knew that saving his own soul would be the expense of everyone else's soul. And so here, you know, would you follow God even at the expense of your own life? We saw um, just in the past couple days, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to follow God even though it meant that their life might end. Daniel was willing to follow God even though it meant that he might lose his life. And the same thing, you know, will you follow God even at the expense of your own life? And again, we live in America, we don't really have the risk of that. That's not something. But again, are we really giving our whole life to God? That could also be our time. 
Now, um, you guys are using your time very wisely this summer by dedicating it to this training program, by teaching the children. And we have to, you know, ask ourselves, are we willing to dedicate our lives to the things that God wants us to be doing? And our strength comes from God alone. Satan tried to convince Jesus that he didn't need God. He said, I can give you all the kingdoms of the world. You can do it on your own. But Jesus turned to God for his strength rather than taking Satan up on his offer to take the easy way out. And the last question there, do you rely upon God for your strength or try to do it on your own? And that's also important. As you guys have been teaching clubs this past week, it takes a lot out of you. You're tired at the end of the day and you've got to do it all again tomorrow. And where is that strength coming from? Where is that energy coming from to teach those kids? Are you trying to do it all on your own? Because that's going to fail. You need to make sure that you're spending time in prayer and that the words you're giving those kids, the strength that you have to get up there and be energetic in front of those kids, is coming from God because he's our only source of strength.